Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, greetings and salutations and welcome to this edition. In fact, this is a block talk. So we have a series of block talks on the women of BSV and these are led by the beautiful Robin Delissa. Today we've got a special guest called John Bruno, who is the Director of Engineering at Uber and former Head of Global Infrastructure at Microsoft. So John is an engineering lead with over 25 years experience building world-class software and he has 16 patents. So welcome to this series of blog talks and I'm going to pass you over to our beautiful hostess Robin. Is it 16 patents Bruno? I think that's the right number yeah. <laughs> what are your patents? Let's start with that then like let's just kind of briefly go over what, what are the, most of the patents uh, based on what technology? Uh, they vary they go back as far as my tenure in the uh, MSN space back in say 2006 to 2008 there's some on the on the windows phone platform which you may mm -hmm. recall microsoft dabbled in i loved that phone until that we phone. lost coming to visit you at microsoft in seattle then i did not love that phone it was the bing search the bing maps there you go there you go um and then several in the in the game space okay so let's talk about our history bruno how long have we yeah. known each other let's put you on the spot uh well you've definitely known me uh a long time because when we first met i did not have all this silver hair uh, neither believe, one of us had children <laughs> uh, i believe it was around 1999 give or take okay yeah uh, sounds about right right I before was, the dot-com implosion that's right in fact you yeah. helped me help recruit me into the dot-com implosion into <laughs> Florida in 1999. and hot, a hot office was it hot <laughs> office <laughs> com, that's so right. Bruno, when I, I started my tech recruiting career in 1997, I believe, uh, probably 1998, actually, and I worked for the number one tech recruiting firm in the world. It was called, um, I, well, I worked for the software division. So our division was called Maxim Group. It was a division of Aerotech, uh, and Aerotech is now known as uh, Tech Systems, they, they were the largest, most profitable tech recruiting firm in the world. And we both lived in South Florida. Our Fort Lauderdale office was actually the number one office in the entire world. And I wound up uh, working for the number one sales guy where I had amazing training and, and mentoring. Um, and by year two, I was named number six recruiter globally for the organization out of thousands of recruiters uh, around the globe. And so we, we had you know, something we called the tech team and our tech team was our best of the best. And they interviewed our candidates before we presented them to the clients. So we knew that they had the technical chops of what whatever technology they needed to know and, and the skill set, right? Before we contracted them out to IBM and Motorola and, and large technical companies and, and top moms. And so Bruno was on our tech team. He was one of he was our best of our best. Uh, what was it back then? VBASP, SQL, and then .NET. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Flavor of the day. Yeah. Okay, so you were, he was on our tech team, so the, everybody on our tech team would come to the office once a month, and we'd sit around talking about everything we needed to deal with for the committee, basically, for our tech team and our interviews, and, and constantly upgrading, refining the program, and then we'd all go out for drinks afterwards. And then Bruno got recruited to Microsoft, when I, which I believe was, uh, what did they call it, like a neighbor sales team or like a special ops team? You're confusing me with the other guy. Um, Dickens, Jonathan Morrison? That's right. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was recruited into MSN at the time. Um, and I, I ran the back end for what was then uh, one of the first social networking, blogging, photo sharing services uh, worldwide called MSN Spaces. Ah. It had over 120 million users. It was connected to MSN Messenger. It was like the early days of social networking and chat on the internet. Um, and it was a big platform. It was where I, where I really started to learn how to go scale websites and, uh, and applications. Okay. Interesting. So uh, how long did they run spaces before they canned it? Since we don't have it today, obviously. Uh, they ran it probably until maybe 2008, 2009 timeframe. They, they converted everything from MSN to Windows Live, uh, mm. another one of uh, Microsoft's infinitely great branding decisions. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the Windows Live platform of online services got kind of merged into Windows later. Uh, so things like MSN Messenger got merged into like, you know, chat inside of Windows and then eventually into things like Link, uh, which and Skype and now Teams, like all of those technologies continue to sort of persist. And, into, and they, they wind up intersecting and then becoming these hybrid. Uh, that's products. right. And that's yeah. right. And just, just for a little bit of interesting history, the thing that we, the back end of MSN Spaces was called MSN Storage and MSN okay. Storage 
uh, was a large, you know, scale storage service um, that eventually got merged in with what is now Azure. Which, which was a SAN? Was it a storage? <laughs> It was actually, it's actually now merged in with Azure storage. So all that sort ah. of that cloud storage thing that everyone, you know, talks about, like that's actually originated as a use case uh, in MSN. Interesting. Yeah. So who, who really came up with cloud initially? Uh, the cloud pro program at Microsoft was actually started by Ray Ozzy. Um, but who as a company really introduced cloud to the world? Oh, well, it started with Amazon, right? It, it, Amazon, it, 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 okay. probably, um you know, it, it, as I understand that story, they grew out of an internal need uh, of scaling mm -hmm. their own compute needs. Makes and sense. they realized, hey, this is something we could probably commoditize and sell. Yep. Um, and, you know, Ray Ozzy believed the same thing at Microsoft. I don't exactly know, you know, the timetables of when, who started what first, but yeah. Um, yeah. certainly Amazon was first to market. Um, and then Azure came to market about five years after AWS. Amazing. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So then, uh, what what all products did you work on over your tenure at Microsoft? Because you were there for what six sixteen years? Almost fifteen. Almost fifteen. 15. Yeah, I was close. Yeah. I'm with my uh, nemesis. So I'm surprised that I was even close. <laughs> so walk us through your your career at Microsoft. What all products did you touch on or own at what point? Okay, sounds great. Um, I I started with the MSN team as I mentioned. That lasted about two years. I moved over to incubate a service on the Windows Phone called the Windows Phone Marketplace, uh, basically an app store for the Windows Phone 6.5 and 7 devices. Um, in that role, I was primarily focused on building an, you know, a pipeline for engineers to bring their apps to market and then market those apps and get paid and sort of you know vis-a-vis -vis what you see today on iPhone or Android, right? Uh, early days of that on on Windows Phone. Um, I, I that sort of led me to the Xbox Live team in 2011. Um, in 2011, um, I joined them to work on mobile gaming. Uh, and uh, after a series of reorgs and things of that nature, it ended up becoming part of the broader Xbox Live team. Uh, during that time, it was about three and a half, four years, uh, I worked on pretty much everything inside of Xbox Live you could think of. Everything from your avatar to large scale, you know, cloud-based cloud multiplayer. How fun um, is that? Your your kids must think you're like their hero. Like my kids think yeah. I'm a dork, or like maybe they'll think I'm cool if I tell them I know you. The first time in my life anyone really understood what I did. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe the last, actually. Um, <laughs> so you know that was cool. Got to preside over the construction of Xbox One. You know from the beginning to the end. Uh, worked with a series of different game studios on a lot of different. You know, IP that uh, came to market with you know massive online online multiplayer, you know using some of the platforms that we built. Uh, we built the biggest multiplayer service in the world on a cloud provider at that time. Oh, okay. It was uh, I think first of its kind, not probably not last of its kind, but definitely first of its kind. Um, and that that experience kind of got me into this idea of you know how do we get more low latency application capabilities to markets that were, you know, not wasn't where it wasn't conducive to connect a customer from say Australia back to a data center in the US. And so I ended up moving into Azure where I I, I drove uh, global infrastructure for, you know, several years, uh, helping Azure go from 18 regions of, uh, you know, data centers, if you will, to uh, 56 when I left, we were working on number 56. Um, and that was that was pretty cool. We got to put data centers on all the far corners of the world, everywhere from uh, the you know the UK, which is not a far corner of the world, to uh, to where, to where they pronounce patents as patents. Yeah, patents, right. patents yes. <laughs> tomatoes uh, and tomatoes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we put data centers in the UK, um, India, uh, South Africa, the UAE. Australia, all kinds of places all around the world. But how do you pick the locations, the geographic locations for the data centers? I mean, it's got to be based on natural weather patterns and disasters and a, a wide variety of things, huh? Uh, believe it or not, that has very little to do with it. We actually pick, pick really? a lot of the locations based on sort of some of the changing ge geopolitical climate where a lot ah, of and costs. countries... Sure. Well, well, countries were asking for data residency. They wanted their, their, you know, let's say the businesses inside of Germany, as an example, to keep their data on soil. Uh, and if you want to be a cloud provider in Germany, ah. you, you, you want to be in Germany with your cloud. 
Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of data residency and, and compliance kind of drove a lot of the early data center expansion. Certainly la latency has for a number of, you know, sort of latency sensitive applications, gaming being one of them. But I think, the, you know, Tom, the more define you... latency because we have, we cater to really, really non-technical people, artists, and um, all the way up to really advanced techies and really advanced blockchain people. So will you define latency for us, for our audience? Sure. I mean, latency is basically the time it takes for a, a single bit of data to go from your computer to the cloud and back. Got it. Um, or in the case of a game, like the way games work, uh, every little movement the player makes in the game is a, a packet of data that mm -hmm. gets communicated to the other players in the game. Yeah. And so the, the trick with those types of applications is you don't want any sort of lag in that experience. You want that to be very fluid. So the right. higher the latent or the lower the latency, the better the fluidity of that uh, experience. Okay. Um, and it's particularly with multiplayer, right? You like every one of those those little moves is being calculated and sent across to all the players in the game. So it's, I mean, it's actually quite a magical thing when you think about the technical yeah. aspects of what complex. It's it's super complex. Yeah. Did there must be like loads of technical challenges with that? I mean, like you say, especially when you've got a massive multiplayer online game and say like you've got 30 players and you've got this huge world that you're playing. It's like, how do you get around all these challenges? Like, what are the worst technical challenges that you've come across and how did you get around them? So actually, you know, to kind of double click on this scenario a little bit, this is why we built the massive uh, online multiplayer service inside of Azure for Xbox One, because you know, in, the, in the history of multiplayer gaming on consoles, it was typically going to be peer to peer. Um, which I know you're all, you're all familiar with in the blockchain world. Yeah. Um, and the, the challenge with peer to peer is when you start to stretch your player base across large geographical areas, uh, you start to see lag in game. You start to see different experiences that just get poor for the customer, um, whether that's you know the voice lagging or the game itself lagging. And so the idea with a, a a server based multiplayer is that you put a server in the middle of all the players, where you know we, you try to find the connection that's best for everyone in the game. And so instead of everyone having to commu communicate with each other over the network, they're all just communicating with the server and the server is arbitrating all of the data bits for everyone. Right. Um, and so where that really gets interesting is that you know when you have a massively scaled cloud that's on every continent short of Antarctica, um, you build much better experiences for the customers who are playing, you know, say PC games in South Africa with, mm -hmm. with, with other, other people who may be playing in the UK, right? right? So, um, you really kind of open up a lot of different avenues for the game developer to now enrich in the game because now they're they're not as bound up by what they can send over the wire, if that makes sense. Cool. Okay. So uh, Xbox, then you went on to, did we finish the whole trajectory of your career at Microsoft or did we get to the cloud? We sort of took a hiatus. And, and, yeah, and, I thought and, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so um, I did the, you know, the global infrastructure role for a long time. And uh, in the, in that role was not just about building more data centers, it was also about building more resiliency models uh, for the cloud. So how does the cloud survive, um, you know, outages and, and issues, if you will, for, for our customers. During that time, I got to work with a lot of interesting customers around the world, both, you know, on the gaming side as, as well as on the, on the non-gaming side. Right. Um, in 2000, I guess, 18? 19, something like that. I, uh, I left the global infrastructure world and actually moved back to Florida from Seattle where I had lived and worked at Microsoft for, for many years. Um, wanted to be back closer to my family, um, particularly as my father's health was declining and, and things of that nature. So I took a role as a remote employee working on uh, the Azure machine learning team, particularly mm. working on hardware acceleration for machine learn models. Uh, and working uh, very closely with um, people you probably know very well, the, the inventors of ChatGPT. Okay. Um, and so I, I, was, I tried to interview an open AI. I, I did interview a Neuralink. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I worked with open AI uh, as you know a customer, if you will, of what we were trying to, to do in, inside of Microsoft for a few years. Um, Good group of people, very, very intelligent, um, far more intelligent than I am. And uh, the knowledge of what they're doing is like incredible. Um, and so, but but that was another, you know, sort of big distributed systems problem, if you will. Right. Um, so I got to, I got to learn a lot. Processing tons of data. I mean, the amount of data that they have to process for something like that is, is pretty right. mind-bending. And, 
and also a big kind of sort of networking latency problem as it, as right. it were. Uh, so that was an interesting, I'll say just distributed systems problem for, for me to learn. So uh, wait, we're going to pause there because this is something that is wildly misunderstood. And I don't even know if you and I have gotten into this. I don't think we have. What is the difference between distributed systems and de decentralized systems? Because this is something that's wildly misunderstood in blockchain and in Bitcoin and really especially in, in BSV. Um, well, I'm probably not going to define it as purely as I should from a computer science standpoint. But what I would say in, in my layman's example is a decentralized system is one where you probably have components of the system that are literally, you know, in different parts of the world, uh, all working together over some network, if you will. Um, whereas from a distributed system standpoint, what you, what you often find is, is those systems are in are proximal to each other. Quite, quite proximal to each other, but but oftentimes the workload is sliced into very small components uh, that require you know, lots and lots of processing individually, so that they're kind of you know they're able to then you know work together at scale. So a great great example of that probably we make MapReduce, where they're you know splitting data up into small chunks. All these machines are operating on data at very you know very high throughput. And they're synthesizing their results with each other uh, in very close proximity. So that's more of where I, where I see the distributed systems being different than decentralized system, where you have small amounts of work happening on nodes all around the network, if that makes sense. Okay, got it. Did I pass uh, that time? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna show you, I, I think I sent you, I might have texted to you, but I remember we talked about this when we met with Brandon and Delray, and I, I said I was gonna send you some infograms because they break up, like when Grim Craig talks about it, like he shows these beautiful, what do they call it? Did he Mandela diagrams? And they like he he really defines decentralized and um, Mandela networks. Mandela networks, right? Mandela networks. So uh, whatever. Well, we'll talk about that later. But it's it's an interesting point that uh, should be should be um, insightful for a lot of people. So we can have a whole another conversation about that. Well, that's interesting then. So, like, how do you ensure the security and privacy in distributed systems like that? Like, what are some of the common approaches for protecting sensitive data when it comes to multiple nodes and things across those systems? Yeah, well, it's a great question. So a lot, a lot of those systems are in and of themselves, um, you know, sealed in terms of, um, you know, they're, they're, run, they're running in their, their own container. So, you, so no one, you can't really get in or out. You know, they only have access to the data that they have access to. Um, but typically what often happens in, no, no one has, I guess, no one, no one to my knowledge is really doing a lot of work where you um, say do shared AI modeling. And by that, I mean, where you have different contributors of data who are contributing to the AI model. And then the, then the, then the training of that model is, is sort of holistically operating on everyone else, everyone's data who's in that, in that cohort. Um, the challenge with that is that, you know, it can be done with, an, with anonymized data. And there are there are ways that I think you know people are, are working to try to bring say you know let's take a, a pharmaceutical example a lot of pharmaceutical companies contributing their data to to a, a singular AI model the, the, the trouble you get into is is you know many of them want to maintain the security and privacy of their own data so you end up kind of sanitizing a lot of the data uh, you don't get as rich of a data set you know they're still trying to kind of crack the nut on how do you do distributed training with multiple parties, uh, if that makes sense. Whereas a lot of the things that you see with like a chat GPT is that they're just ingesting public data and they're operating on public data. And so, you know, you don't have as much of this, I'll say sharding and containerizing of, of the different data sets and the privacy and security implications of each one. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I'm not gonna make fun of you for using the word sharding because we know you're using a technical term. It's shard with a D. <laughs> Lucky we're not at happy hour. Um, okay, so does is anybody actually doing AI right now, or is it all just really advanced machine learning models? Well, when you say AI, do you do you mean like actual? I don't mean like singularity, but I mean if so far everything. So, like the example I give you is in the recruiting world. Like you know, they come up with all this software and they try and say it's AI this and AI that, and it's not AI in any way. It's a little bit more automated. It's a little bit smarter, but it's not AI in any way. And so far, any AI work that I've seen, it's really just advanced machine learning models. So I'm curious what your perspective is that on that being much more of a tech expert than I am. Um, I think potato, potato a little bit. It, it is, um, I think AI, 
ML to me are almost like somewhat interchangeable at this stage. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> right? um, and and really, if you go back even a little further, a lot of you know MapReduce and things that were going on is just kind of search technologies. Yeah. Um, have have morphed into now you know a sexier name I suppose is is machine learning, but I but I think you know at the end of the day really what it what it the magic of all of that is just the the ability to get very quick results on you know uncorrelated and correlated data sets. And I, you know, I, I don't know if people realize or don't realize, but that is exactly how at Uber riders are matched with drivers yeah. um, using machine learned models that are incredibly fast and incredibly smart, you know, built on, you know, very complex data sets, not the least of which includes like geographical data that's sort of, you know, different city by city. Right. That's interesting. So, I, I saw it. Sorry, I was saying about AI and AGI. I actually watched a, a, a documentary the other day, yesterday actually, and it was the head of Google and the head of Microsoft who were talking about the AI chat GPT-4, yeah? And the fact that the, there is this AI war between the two companies at the moment. That's correct. And both of them seem to think, at least in this interview I saw, both of them seem to think that the AGI is already at that point because it can do, is it cogent, like describe arguments, so it's cogent is what they think it is, which means it can describe logical and clear convincing arguments. And this is the, the, the like literally the head of Microsoft and the head of Google, and it was they say it's it's on I, I watch a lot of youtube documentaries and that's what i was watching it was only a 15 minute thing but i felt that was really interesting because obviously there are a lot of people who say no it's not there it is machine learning at the moment but they want to roll it out really quickly to the general public and they were saying it's like at least seven years ahead of where they thought it should be at the moment i mean how do you feel about that what's your take on that i know i mean i know you just sort of said about machine learning but i still think that they are um they're Different. they're hyping they're hyping the results. Exactly. So they're too oh. excited. They're too, ex too excited about what's happening at the moment. Yeah. I think I think the results are amazing. But if you if you just kind of you know take a look neurologically at what how many parameters they say a human brain can process, mm. uh, I want to say it's north of a hundred trillion. Um, and this is like somewhat someone smarter than me knows this number, but I think it's probably somewhere north of a hundred trillion. Um, okay. As I understand GPT-4, it's a it's a trillion parameter model, and so if you're like so, you you could argue that they're still a hundred x away from what a brain can do. Uh, and if you really unpack the the horsepower that they need, a hundred trillion. I googled it. <laughs> you, you did it quicker than I could. There, there you go. So, Google says a hundred trillion. So 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 don't don't invite me to to you know trivial pursuit games though because I don't, I don't have those games here. But uh, the uh, you know what I would say is I think they've made massive progress, but the the amount of horsepower it takes to train that model is serious horsepower. Significant, oh, yeah, of course. Serious, and no, and no one's no one's talking about the power problem because that's a taboo conversation. Which and, is one of the conversations today to have. We're talking. We want to talk about power and energy usage in, in mining and Bitcoin and mining, right? That's, right. Uh, that's yeah. certainly, uh, and you know, the world um, loves their little politically correct things. And so the the the, the World Economic Forum and our, our Klaus Schwab's of the world have been pushing this ESG agenda. And now every big corporation in the world has got ESG agendas. I was recruiting for uh Morgan Stanley and they they had an ESG project I was recruiting for so uh, and I spoke to a lot of different banks and a lot of financial institutions and they all had ESG initiatives right and I did some research on it to see who was who you know who had been working in that field and who had expertise but obviously it's a big uh, it's a big topic of conversation one from the perspective of you know saving the planet and, and climate change and then two from the perspective of these you know these corporate agendas which I think is a lot of Hype also a lot of BS, but uh, but certainly the the ESG agenda for a lot of these companies. I'm sorry if there's feedback. Anybody want to talk uh, about Bitcoin mining, energy usage, uh, what we believe is maybe the greatest uh, mining? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? I, I'll be honest. I don't I don't know how that that problem stacks up to 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 power consumption, but I I will say that you know everyone's sort of struggling with the power situation as data centers continue to grow and take over the planet, right? Yeah. This, is, 
this is a it is as innovative as it is it's you know there's really it's going to be a, a stretch to get as far as we want to go um you know with any sort of environmental agenda because power is the real limiting factor right now and uh you know if you're in the data center business and you your your whole modus operandi is to find cheap power that's how you make money in the data center business right you build in places mm -hmm. where you can get cheap power right um, so I do think, you know, the more hungry we become as a society for to solve these problems, the, the, the more important it's going to be that we find a way to do it cleanly and cheaply. Okay. So what is this? Okay. I'm going to ask a really dumb question. Um, are clouds backed up to actual physical data centers? Clouds are, clouds are physical data centers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're saying one of the chief problems is to try and find the cheapest sources of energy for these data centers. Correct. That's right. Okay. Let me give you a quick tour of how how the data center world works. Give me it. Hit so, us. It, it, so I'll give you a, a couple of things. A normal, like I, I say, a normal data center today that's say, um, let's just pick a number, five megawatts. Okay. It's a very, it's not a big data center. It's definitely not hyperscale. The hyperscalers are building 500 megawatt data centers in, you know, all around, you know, in big places on the earth. And a five megawatt data center is about a football field full of machines. So if you figure the average home is taking what, 200 kilowatts, uh, something like that. Because um, we're not charging a Tesla. Right. And so, uh, you know, that's so five, five times that is a megawatt. Another five times that is five megawatts. So it takes, what is that, uh, 25 homes worth of energy to power one single five megawatt data center. Give or wow. take. These are rough. Wow. Rough, very okay. rough. So then now you now you start to you start to think about well what is a what does a hyperscaler data center look like? Yeah. It, look, it looks like imagine driving down the road and seeing like a cluster of home depots. <laughs> um, it's about I mean a, a hyperscale data center is about the size of a home depot. Yeah. Um, north of a hundred thousand square feet, you know, massive amount of power. Microsoft used to used to talk to customers about the amount of fiber connections just between the data centers, yeah, um, and the amount of fiber that they run, you know, around the world, and how many times you could go back and forth to the moon with that same length of fiber. Yeah, it's a massive industrial um, accomplishment. Like people don't yeah. think about this, but it, but this is what's going on behind your Instagrams, behind your, your TikToks, like these are yeah. what's happening, right? Um, and the more we, we crave those, those things as a society, the more we're going to be building these data centers, wherever we can find the, the land and the power to power them. Right. And so what is the cheapest way to power them right now? Is there, I mean, maybe it's not cookie cutter and it's not one all be all, but what are, what are the top strategies that companies are using? Uh, there's, a, I mean, there's a little bit of, of, I'll say, green energy power that's coming into play, especially, especially around solar. Um, but you know, as you know, in the power industry, uh, they they get sort, they never really tell you what the what the actual source is, right? There's there's a mixed bag of different sources. Gotcha. Um, and so, you know, when you think about you know data center efficiencies, they measure themselves against this metric called PUE, which is a measure of how efficient they're using their power. Um, and most big companies, Microsofts or Amazons or Googles or Oracles, will all have a published, you know, sort of PUE. This is what our, you know, this is how well we're doing relative to our green energy targets. But there's no silver bullet for the green energy solution here that's going to, you know, short of nuclear, which I think everyone dislikes. Um, oh, no, you know, everybody's raving, raving about nuclear again. Elon Musk won't shut up about it. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. It's the most sane and rational conversation we can be literally, having. Literally, literally, all the intellectuals, all the figure—I don't I want to say figureheads, the leaders, thought leaders of the big tech companies are all back on nuclear. But it's, yeah. If you're on Twitter, you hear, you see it all day, every day. That's great. That's great. It's it is the it is the conversation we should be having. Yeah. Um, especially since there's a lot of these companies who are doing like small modular nuclear um, yeah. power plants. I think. Yep those things are, are frankly going to have to save our butts in the future. Yeah, that's exactly what Musk has been saying. And I'm super fascinated with uh, space exploration and, and becoming an interplanetary species. And, and we're in this age of blockchain where blockchain is intersecting with that, right? Like I went to a conference in Cape Canaveral last year after the Bitcoin 2022 conference, and it was a tiny conference, but the 
conversation that we had and the people that were in the room was insane. And, you know, the conversation was, you know, okay, if we become an interplanetary species, who gets jurisdiction? Is it United States? Is it China? Right? Like, and these people sit on forums at the United Nations and they're establishing these programs and policies and certainly that has become a conversation recently that we will be powering things in space with nuclear energy and that it's the the, the right solution so it's definitely being uh, discussed out there in, in public and, and nuclear is definitely favored again even though it was hated for so long and um taboo if you will in south africa at the moment i don't know if you know this or not but there's um rolling power courts so every week, like for about three or three days a week, they, they literally shut the power off. And that's like the load shedding. So this is, is this? That's always happened. That's not a recent thing. That has always happened. Yeah. So but this is a major problem for companies that rely mm-hmm. on sort of, of services and, and everything, isn't it? Yes. So right. how, how does that affect I mean, like for yourselves, does it affect yourselves? I mean, South Africa is a huge country with a a, lot, a big population. Yeah, and just like well, that, Sydney, you, you you got us into the resiliency conversation, which is a great, yeah. great segue. Um, <laughs> so, so back so, to the yeah. resiliency conversation, right? Um, yeah. Look, this was a huge consideration for us when we put data centers in South Africa. But the way the way you you manage that is with um, standby power. Uh, and redundancy of, of power. So there's, you know, in many cases, data centers are, are the ideal cases. You build data centers uh, where you share, where you have different power companies. Um, a- Amazon did a great job of this in Ohio, for example. They they source power from multiple different power companies. Mm-hmm. So if one has a problem, they can revert to the other one fairly fairly easily. Um, but in places like South Africa, where you maybe have one power company and you need to have five nines of availability for your power, you need generators. And those What's, generators- What is five nines? Five nine hour shifts, what? Five nines of availability is sort of the gold standard of, of, of data center uptime. It, okay. means, it means that you don't have any interruptions in service, 99.99. Yeah, I've heard the 99.9 high availability. Yep. And so yeah. it boils down to a certain number of hours a year. I want to say it's about eight hours a year. Okay, um, got it. And uh, nine, you know, nine, 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 okay, 99.99. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, so everyone strives to the five nines availability or higher, right? Okay, uh, and, and and that's why you have backup generators on every single data center. Uh, even, that, that even causes problems because something needs to run the generators, and usually right. it's, it's fossil fuel or something, so that's uh, a huge issue correct. as well. Yeah, it's 100% correct. So you, so, you have diesel tanks usually on site. Uh, are your generators for periods of time. Uh, and, you know, this is where you start to get into interesting risk-based conversations. Uh, so mm-hmm. when, you're, when you're talking to technologists about resiliency, a lot of them will say, well, geez, I'm really worried about, about X or Y or Z. Um, but almost never does anyone worry about what happens if we run out of gas in the generators. And so... Um, this actually happened to people I know uh, here in South Florida several years ago oh. d- during a hurricane. Uh, they literally almost ran the tanks dry. And so these are these are real problems. Uh, it happened in Virginia during Superstorm Sandy, where mm-hmm. uh, many of the big hyperscalers were running on generator and uh, everyone's negotiating to get tanker trucks delivered to their yeah. location, right? And so these are these are things that, you know, when you think about you know, protecting your business, you're not often thinking about, well, geez, what happens to the guy who's trying to get the gas truck to the data center uh, in the middle of That's right. Storm Sandy yep. um, so that my customers can use their application, right? Where, by the way, they're on, what's it called, a lockdown after eight o'clock at night, like when they're not even supposed to be on the roads and <laughs> there's all kinds of other variables that make that complicated. That's right. In some cases, yeah. they're shutting down interstate commerce during yeah, that time. 100%. Trip. And so, yeah. you know, the, this is where, you know, building applications that are resilient to uh, data center location failures becomes super important, right? And you, you want to, you wanna, if something is happening on the eastern seaboard of the U.S., uh, you really don't want your customers being affected by that. You, you need right. to be able to run out of other locations. Right. Which, of course, in Florida, we're prone to hurricanes. So that's always been a huge issue for any company in South Florida. You always had a data center, a disaster recovery site somewhere in a much more safe location. Right. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, yeah, we had a one year for a hurricane. I'm not going to mention his name because he's my competitor. <laughs> and when I was staffing Kaplan, and Kaplan was in their heyday, like grew like I want to say they grew over two thousand percent year over year for like five years in a row. They just blew up overnight, and they were hiring hundreds and hundreds of tech people. Um, my competitor, they were shut down, and nobody could work, and they were in some mission critical projects. So my competitor was smart enough to go and like somehow broker a tank of fuel to get to the building so they could keep working and he could keep building his contractors. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was super I, smart. I was like, Hey, props to you. Like you might be my competitor, but I respect that. <laughs> yep. And, and yeah. you know, there, there, there is some work going on uh, to do things like hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah. Um, backup power. That's the other big, big go-to for energy right now. Right. Hydrogen fuel. Yeah. That's right. But, but, but I think, Look, I'll just I'll say strategically, if I were a big power company looking to do something innovative and green, I would be talking to everybody who owns lots and lots of data centers because it's the place to go test scale for these kinds of backup systems. Uh, who has who has the largest data centers in footprints in the world? Who who are the top? I mean, Microsoft has to be up there, if not. I think it's I think it's I think it's you know Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and probably Google as the third. Yeah. Uh, there may yeah. be there, there may be a larger um, that's say owned by private equity or or you know like a digital realty or something like that that's actually selling data center space. Sure. Um, but in terms of like single tenant ownership, I think the, those three are probably the biggest. Is that is that worldwide or is that just US based? Because obviously there's like so oh no, worldwide. Um, yeah, is that worldwide? Worldwide. Okay. 100%. So, I think world worldwide for sure. I mean, there, there's a lot of data center providers out there. Um, but I don't think maybe maybe I guess that's what I say is as maybe private equity they have yeah they have, uh, like large portfolios, but in terms of like single tenant where it's just owned and run by the same company. Um, right. Think, think about what. Um, think about if, you know Musk moving from California to Texas is an interesting play because there's a lot of reasons, but that made sense for them, right? And then he's even. I, I, I would argue that he's going to move Neuralink hopefully there as well, right? So he started with Tesla and, and uh, SpaceX and now Neuralink. Um, but what did he do? He went in and he befriended the local politicians, the, the governor, right? And then he started, you know, California had those crazy issues with the, I forget the name of the California power plant, but PPE or whatever their name is, PPG, whatever. Um, but they had huge, horrible issues in the state of California. And so he went to Texas. Texas is, um, those in the Bitcoin mining world, most people in the United States try to move to Texas and set up their mining operations because it's the, the lowest commercial cost for electricity for the mining operations. There's other states that have maybe have lower periods, uh, but the price fluctuate. So on average, like month over month, year over year, uh, Texas offers the, the lowest energy price. And so I would argue that Musk probably negotiated a lot of that and had a lot of direct influence and it was to move SpaceX, Tesla, now Neuralink to Texas because there was better political atmosphere for him, better uh, alliances with government and, and legislation and then a, the ability to go in and help their power plant, their their provider to the state of Texas also um, increase their ability and their um, resilience, if you're your word, resilience or their, you know, their uptime, because they also had issues where they were down quite a bit during different natural disasters. So it, it's interesting as we're talking about energy, I just think of, you know, of course, Musk always is brilliant in his moves, but for many reasons, it was smart for him to move these companies to Texas. And in the Bitcoin world, so many miners are, are moving there. Yeah, certainly <laughs> business friendly climate in Texas, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the power is reasonably cheap. Um, for a long time, San Antonio was a big data center market. Um, ah, okay. That, it, that it's a, it is as big anymore. But now I feel like uh, the, the next up and coming data center market uh, is Phoenix. Uh, where hmm. there's also lots of land and power and you've seen a lot of, a lot of, you know, people moving there as well. But again, you know, it's mostly business friendly climate. Well, yeah. Texas and Florida have no state income tax. And so even um, for the personal income, uh, it's favorable. And then for uh, the tax environment for businesses as well, it's, it's a very favorable environment um, from that perspective too. So um, for sure. I'm, not as, I'm not as familiar with Phoenix, but uh, they have that weird time zone thing. Right. Where they don't, they're not time zone. 
it's so weird. I'm like, I, it's like a, you have to double check to figure out what time it is there, depending on the time of year it is. Like, so weird. Or it falls under the, you know, the... Um, this is a little bit different, but regarding Phoenix and the whole of the like Arizona State and everything as well, every now and again there are droughts, and they're saying that the, the rivers are actually drying up more and more. So is that – I mean, are these like geographical things that people – obviously they take into consideration. You're saying about the weather and everything, but what about that kind of aspect? You know, I mean, sure. you've got quakes and you've got fault lines and things like that. I mean, all of this needs to be taken into consideration, doesn't it? hundred um, percent. You're very smart, Diddy. Um, the, the, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something that actually, like, we could do a whole show on how data center selection works and how the different, what the different risks, you know, frameworks are that they use to assess these different locations. And that's why you see a lot of the data center providers all congregating in the same places, right? They're, they're, right. they're lower risk, they're lower cost. Um, they don't co-locate them near airports or places where they can have, you know, massive accidents, uh, yeah. rail locations, things of this nature. Um, very, very strategically important decisions to be made um, because of, you know, think about the sensitivity of the data that you're hosting. Yeah. So we, we were on stage at a panel for blockchain and security in Miami one year, and uh, we started joking. Me and a business partner of mine, who's a security guy, and we were like, "Well, just set up mining operations in Iceland because we don't have to pay for cooling." Uh, <laughs> yes, 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 and no. We like the, one of the bigger facilities we were building for Microsoft was in Sweden. Okay. And um, it was it was in the north of well, I shouldn't say the far north of Sweden, but it was definitely north of Stockholm. Yeah. Uh, far enough that you were like that they were dragging power lines to the site while we were, you know, still <laughs> in those days. <laughs> and I, we, we still needed cooling, right? It's, yeah. I mean, the yeah. The that they generate is-, is Yeah, of cooling. course. But it certainly does get a lot better when you don't have to build them in a hot place. Yeah. All right, so this is a good segue to get into our sea cable conversation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruno's a very dear friend of mine, obviously for decades now. And I, I sent him this tweet that I read the other day and it said, and Diddy, if you want to share it to the audience, it's, uh, it says I've been, I don't know who this person is, by the way, Joe Reuter. So he's probably an, uh, actually, let me just look since I'm talking about him. He's an investigative journalist at Reuters in Singapore, uh, Reuters. How do you say it? Reuters? Um, yeah. Routers. Routers. I've been investigating a hidden corner of the U.S. China tech war under CC cables. Washington and Beijing are secretly battling to control this vast network, which carries nearly all the world's data from phone calls to military secrets. And it was a really insightful um, article. And I, so I shared that with Bruno and, and we that kind of started a conversation where we were talking about, you know, one, the geopolitical and the uh, legit political threat of China now getting in bed with Russia and 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 this aspect of the sea cables and the US-China war that's not really being addressed out there publicly very often. So, Bruno, you had some uh, interesting feedback in our text thread. What do you want to comment about that now? And how much uh, are the sea cables an issue when you think about data centers and security? And security of, as you mentioned, extremely important data that may be highly sensitive or, or private or confidential. That's that's definitely part of it. If you if you look at the um, the undersea cable map, um, there's a whole website that shows you every single undersea cable. Uh, it's pretty impressive, right? And and if you if you consider, you know, the, these are the things that bring the internet to the world, um, and there are re there are redundancies in them, uh, but arguably they are a point of vulnerability, um, depending on you know where you are in the world. Exactly. This is the one I'm talking about. Yeah, um, that's good. As you as you look at other far corners of the world, like you'll see, gee whiz, there doesn't look like there's that much connectivity just to the to the horn of you know, the tip of Africa in the south uh, right. South Africa. Um, but geez, it looks like there's a whole lot of comms between North America and Europe. So you know, there's there's lots of redundancy. There's also lots of uh, bandwidth. Um, and but these things going offline means that you know people can have circumstances that are, un, you know, undesirable. Like in the case of the Chinese archipelago, um, those folks could not transact, um, you know, financially with each other. So they sort of, re, you know, went back to a bartering system. Now that's a, that's a pretty, pretty dark place to go. Um, do I think that those, those, that level of risk exists? I don't, 
Um, but I do think that, you know, like any piece of, of global infrastructure, uh, they all have a, a bit of risk associated with them and, and everyone should be considering that risk as they think about how they service their customers through, from data centers. Right. So if, if something does happen, if there's a disruption, you have an alternative. That's the, that's the main point. So what was the uh, accidental cable cuts in the Chinese uh, archipelago islands? Um, I don't know what the accidental cable cuts are other than they were cut. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they, some they some said that to... it was a Chinese experiment and, and it was quote unquote accidental. We don't know. We don't know. Um, we don't know if, you know, according to the articles I've read, they were, they were, you know, supposedly fishing boats that cut them. Uh, I don't know how that works. How deep were, down are these cables? I mean, I would assume pretty deep, but I don't know the, the depth of the depth of the, you know, the ocean floor going, yeah. and, you know, if they, you know, they yeah. caught, I mean, it, it seems hard to, it's hard to fathom that a, a gigantic fiber cable would, would be destroyed by a fishing vessel. But, but Hey, what, what, what do I know? I'm not a fisherman. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the meta point here is they're, they're incredibly important. They're incredibly strategic. And depending on where you are in the world, you may not have enough uh, to keep you connected to the rest of the world. So that's something to consider when you're kind of looking at your all up resiliency and data center strategy. Okay. And uh, again, you said to me privately, and I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot here, so you can tell me to shut up, but <laughs> uh, you said there's two sides. It's the Briggs narrative and the Peter, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Peter Zahan narrative that suggests China cannot survive as a global power for more than five to eight years due to having the most rapidly aging population on Earth with no replacement. With Russia right behind, and, and we certainly discuss this a lot on Twitter. Musk has brought this up many, many, many times that Japan will go out of existence in the near future because they have not reproduced and they don't have enough young people reproducing. And um, they literally will, will no longer be Japanese people if, if they don't start reproducing quickly. I would say I don't have a uh, particular specific belief uh, what's going to, and I don't know what's, what's going to happen, but I think, I think everyone should take a look at Peter Zion's uh, YouTube channel because it's super interesting. You know, as a geopolitical strategist, he talks a lot about the population and what the population growth or decline really means for economics going forward um, and how to think about sort of the changing world we're, we're, we're living in where, you know, there is a there is a battle for, let's say, economic superiority. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I think it's actually spelled Z. E I H A N, but I'm not sure. Um, that's, that's Joe Rogan for you, then. I just nicked that off for Joe Rogan. <laughs> Boom! See, Rogan is not better, Bruno. You're better off with the women of blockchain, women of beauty. Um, anyway, I just I think it's worth uh, you know paying paying some attention to what Peter has to say. It's very interesting his uh, his point of view. I don't know if it's you know correct, but he certainly provides a lot of, We're not a lot endorsing of data. it. We're just saying it's interesting, right? Yeah, the, the data he goes through is super fascinating um, and a little bit scary um, yeah. because it means that, that our generation may be working a lot longer than we want to um, right. simply because there just aren't enough people to take over for us. Right. Um, right. And that, you know, that extends to and the U.S. And I know this is a personal issue for Diddy. Like, she does not appreciate these AI things taking jobs away. And as a recruiter, of course, this is a conversation that is I've had ad nauseum over the course of my two decades of recruiting, like in my philosophy, you know, the things that get automated r reduce the non-talented jobs, but it increases the, the specialized jobs and it increases people's ability to earn. But I don't want to. Uh, it's interesting when you put it into the context of the fact that there is an older generation and there are not enough people to take, you know, to do the jobs yeah. of the older generation, like the two uh, one child policy of China and everything. So we know that there is a, a mass older population and not enough. To, so looking at, for, at it from that point of view, yeah, it makes sense. I, but because I work in the entertainment industry and the one industry at the moment that is literally just, you know, decimated by AI is that industry and especially being an artist because yeah. art with um, Mid Journey and you know like Dali and all of those other things as well Adobe Fly Firefly amazing um, so 
that's where I can, you know, I mean, I, I see, I do, like with the editing, AI editors are absolutely fantastic. That cuts my job in half by using an AI editor to edit videos and stuff. But it's just that other side of things. It's like, because I like playing instruments. I like painting. I like do it, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. But I do see, I mean, also voiceover, we were talking about this earlier, where there are some amazing AI um, text to speech uh software programs out there and yeah there's phenomenal. one that came out in the last two weeks that will literally take any video and translate it into any language like, which yeah. is just fascinating to think about right like yeah. that's really complex exactly but you see being being an actress that and yeah. you know that, this is the thing that takes all those jobs that i do are like ah okay yeah so now my life is getting harder and harder and harder but like they can't so, video you, edit diddy they can't do what you do <laughs> well, this is true. This is true. hopefully not. But the, I do, I do yeah. appreciate the context of when you put it into that of the older yeah. generation, and there's not enough to well, continue with that population growth. So this is so of. interesting. I like this. Okay, so my mom was really crazy, and I love her. She's a super smart woman. But my whole life, it was conspiracy theory this and conspiracy theory that. And as I get older, they're not really that conspiracy theory, right? As they yeah, prove to yeah. me. But she was. She was dead set against, I mean, she was kind of a hippie, like she was dead set against nuclear. I mean, I literally lived on and near Navajo reservations up in the mountains past Santa Fe, and we literally stood in on the highway and went hand to hand to prevent the trucks driving through, like to get up to Los Alamos Labs and bring this nuclear waste through our, our land, right, with the native tribes. So um, grew up under that mentality, and now, you know, again, the pendulum has swung back that nuclear is actually the best energy source right now and then on the other one that we just talked about now the other one was that she she actually believed that the world was becoming overpopulated and that we had this reduction of resources or a strain on resources and there's overwhelming evidence now to say that, we, that that's not true we've seen in the u.s the baby boomer generation is now retiring right largest generation ever ever you know in the united states um and the, you know there's a fascinating conversation that uh, Zion that discuss, discusses about how, you know, for the longest time, there were so many of them that, that they, they couldn't really break through on wage, wage earning. So if you think back, like a lot of our parents, um, the wages that they earned were like super cheap compared to what we yeah. earn today. Yeah. Um, and you could say, well, that's kind of inflation. Well, yes and no, right? There, it's, it's also supply and demand. And I think, you know, there's a huge population of them. We're, we're entering a time when that's not happening. It's, uh, at least according to, to, to him, we're not going to see a reprieve of this until the millennials' children uh, join the workforce, which is, you know, near 2045-ish, right? Okay. Um, so we're, we're kind of in for, I don't think AI is going to displace us. Another 22 gonna, years? Yikes. I, I think you're going you're gonna to probably see some consolidation uh, of global powers. I think yeah. you'll probably see a, a move away from globalization, uh, especially given a lot of the complexities around relationships and, uh, and geopolitics at this point. Yeah. So, so are we going into World War Three? Yes or no, people? Yes or no? Did he? Oh, that's interesting because we're in Britain. So I'm, or at least I'm in the UK, and we know, like, we we've been. You're in a vulnerable position. Quite, yeah, we've been threatened quite a few times recently with um, things falling on our heads, which would decimate ourselves. But I, I don't know. I mean, let's go into, you know, are there bigger things to worry about? We talked about. You know, your meteor strikes you don't think are big things to worry about. You've got Yellowstone, you know, you've got your hurricanes, you've got all of this stuff. So, or is it is it the fact that cable, like you say, communication cables can be sabotaged? Is that a bigger threat? The you know, so as, as far as politically, yes, certainly date, sensitive data. I mean, think about how. I mean, we are all techies to some extent, and like. Alan Turing is considered the father of computing or grandfather or whatever, right? I mean, he helped break uh, Morse code, right? With his code breaking skills yes. and the people he recruited. So think about like that ended World War II, right? I mean, that was sensitive data they were able to, to interpret. It, it was the enigma. Of, in, the enigma. Like, yeah. 
Okay. Um, anything else you guys want to cover before we, uh, in our last few minutes of filming, is there anything I did kind of want to cover? Because I still don't understand why. So I guess we'll always need data centers, regardless of if there's one global chain that, that survives or like becomes the prominent chain, we'll always need data centers. I think it's, I think it's 100% true. And I think if, if anything, you're going to need more edge data centers than... than so talk to me, what it, talk to us about what an edge data center is. Define that for us real quick. Uh, the edge is sort of poorly defined, but lot, lots of people say the edge is, is any any sort of end user type computing. Like you could say that the computer in your Tesla is is the edge, right? Because okay. it's it's the closest to to the end user that you can possibly get. What I would call the edge, personally, is uh, you know when you connect to the internet from your mobile phone, you connect to a, a, a network that we we call the edge, and that that is a high speed network that is very proximal to wherever you are in the world. And behind the scenes, that edge connects to other places on the internet. And so where there's bigger pipes and you know specialized connectivity across data centers and so on and so forth. So um, when you think about the edge, think about something like YouTube. YouTube is fast because they, they run it on the edge. They run it as close as you can get to the, to the customer. Um, a lot of times these are you know telco owned data center facilities, they're small. They're sitting in a closet. Like if you're in Miami, Robin, and you're going and you see that big dome thing in the middle of the city, that's actually an edge, uh, a nap point. And there's probably an yeah. edge location there where a bunch of, you know, network connectivity comes together for different people. Um, yeah. Those sort of, you know, is that terror? Closets, no. <laughs> those sort of closets around the internet, I think, are going to be, yeah. become incredibly more strategic for these sort of distributed type workloads, like you're talking about with, with blockchain. Um, where you don't you don't need them to be in these huge monolithic Home Depot sized data centers in the middle of Iowa. Right. You right. need them to be like very close to the, to the population. Okay, really quick. Uh, this is going to be an ignorant question, but again, we cater to all, all audiences. So, what is the difference between? Well, how would you define a mesh network then? If you've now defined edge, what is what does mesh mean? Um, a mesh is very similar to what we talked about earlier with with peer to peer, right? Where where you just you have um, I'm not a good networking person, so I'm going to I'm going to butcher this. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. The head of the global head of infrastructure for Microsoft is not a good networking person. It's, that it's is not hilarious. My, it's not my my strongest suit, I'll say. But but a, but a mesh network you, you can think of is like every node on the network is connected to the other nodes, right? So if you if you yeah. had a like a ring of 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 people on the network, every node on the network talks to every other node. Right. Yeah, it goes back to what I was trying to allude to earlier, which again, I'll send you this diagram, but it's like the Mandela network, the decentralized versus distributed and, and what they meant by decentralized in the in the Bitcoin white paper, which they meant no power. They were decentralizing power. There's no one power system that can control, control it, not even the inventor of, of Bitcoin. Um, okay, Diddy has two like very fun, inspirational kind of uh, questions for you before we wrap. One, yeah. who inspires you the most? And two, yeah. any words of wisdom to share with our audience today? That's a that's a tough question. Um, I would uh, I would always hazard to say one of the most inspirational people for me in my my life personally was Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, uh, okay. And, and, and my reason for that is because he never took no for an answer in terms of what could or could not be done. I I I, I will remove any judgment on on what he was like as a personal human being, but in terms of the things I think. He, he conquered as an engineer and as a, a creative person, I think um, very interesting and influential. I'll, um, I'll introduce you to somebody in the IT world down here in South Florida that lives in a Frank Lloyd Wright home in Miami. You'll love him. Nice. nice. Um, and words of wisdom to share with the audience. Never stop learning. <laughs> we're, we're all advocates of that, the eternal student. All right. Any final thoughts? Any closing uh, arguments? <laughs> I, I would just say like th thanks for the conversation. Thanks for inviting me. It was great to meet you, Diddy. Um, you. Certainly, lo love always love to expand my network of, of interesting and fun people to talk to. So thanks mm -hmm. for offering me that opportunity, and uh, for listening to me ramble on about stuff that I that I enjoy. And now we're gonna we're gonna rope you in to come to the conference at the end of May in London and get you on stage. Oh, so you can meet all kinds of cool, interesting people. That's a commitment for sure. <laughs> uh, let me call Krista. Hold on. Let me let me get the schedule clear. <laughs>
All right, thank you for joining us, Bruno. I love you to death. We've been friends forever, and uh, it was an insightful conversation, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thanks having me.